Well, there you have another episode of Straight Out of Combat Radio, audio medicine by Green Zone Hero. This guest has been on our show before. She is Navy Commander Jeanette Arancibia. And today's show is taking a little bit of a different turn. We're actually going to talk about deployment, what that means, how it takes place, what to expect, and some of her own personal advice on to those who are leaving, those who are coming back, and also to the family members and civilians. It was a great show. And uh, I really appreciate you supporting and continuing to listen to Straight Outta Combat Radio. Your steely-eyed killer shadow in the night You were born to fight You gotta light them up My name is John Krotek, and I want to welcome you to Straight Outta Combat Radio, audio medicine by Green Zone Hero. We're here to honor the wisdom of America's most valuable asset, for combat veterans. We're authentic, we're empowering, we're American. Save us all before they burn it down. I am super excited about today's guest for Straight Out of Combat Radio. She is probably, uh, her leadership is outstanding. She is one of my favorite Navy commanders. She has gotten her hands involved in so many things for the, not only the benefit, of the people who wear the uniform, but she's an amazing example of a lady officer and, and what that exemplifies, all the characteristics that that people look up to and that makes our Navy what it is today, the world's finest Navy. And, you know, I bleed Army green. And for those of you who know me who've been in the Army, you know how close the Army is. But if I had to be in another branch of service because of Commander Aaron CB, I'd probably join the Navy. She's just outstanding. She's assigned as a health security Cooperation Readiness and Training Officer at Navy Entomology Center of Excellence in Jacksonville Naval Air Station. In fact, the last time I saw Jeanette Aaron Sebia, she was riding on the back of her Harley Davidson, and she was at the uh, Adamac Harley Davidson dealership up in Jacksonville, and she was putting a medal, a gratitude professor medal, around the neck of a United States Marine, Brandon Long, who works there who was missing his lower part of his body. And uh, I got to tell you, uh, when Commander Aaron Sebia put the medal around this young Marine's neck, every single eyeball that had eyes on that episode uh, was teary. And it made me proud to be an American. It made me proud to be a veteran. And it sure as hell made me proud to be a friend of Commander Aaron Sebia's. It was an outstanding moment in my life, and I'm sure that young Marine will never forget that moment. We're breaking new ground today. Jeanette's going to tell us a little bit about her background. We haven't really scripted anything. We'll talk a little bit about that, but we're breaking new ground today with Straight of Combat. We're not going to really talk so much about history. What we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about deployment. And what we would like to do with this episode, the commander and I had a little bit of conversation. We would like to talk about what that's all about what it's about for the service person that's leaving this country to go defend our rights and our freedoms, but what it's like for the family back home and what we would like the civilians to know about how that deployment affects these families and those who serve. So without any further ado, we can talk a little bit about her background and how she got to the Navy. I want to welcome Commander Jeanette Aaron Sebia, uh, one of the world's finest naval officers ever, to Straight Outta Combat Radio. Thanks for being here, Commander. Thank you so much. Gosh, I feel after those accolades, there's probably someone in after me. <laughs> <laughs> Stop that. No, it's all true. You know, we don't butter. I don't need, we don't butter people up around here. We, we you know, we just, we tell it how it is. And uh, that's, that's ex- the army way, right, John? <laughs> that's the army way. We just, we do what we have to Hoo-ah. do. Yeah, exactly. And um, it's kind of neat to have you back on the show and and to really talk about something different for a change, and deployment's a big deal. But tell the listeners a little bit about uh, how you got to the Navy, and then we can get into the deployment story. But but sure. tell us a little bit about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. So for those that maybe haven't heard the last show, I joined the Navy as a direct accession. Uh, after 9-11, I made the decision to join because I was uncomfortable with the fact that other Americans and uh, some of my family and myself felt it was um, unfair and even a bit unsafe to not feel like we had the freedom of movement in our own country. 
And so I decided to proactively make a, a change. I thank my mother and my family for supporting me in that venture, my girls. And uh, so after, gosh, after 16 and a half, almost 17 years, uh, what started out is uh, I want to go do that. I, I can tell you, not only have I I've done everything that I really had a goal to do, but I've gone so far beyond that. And it's a testament to um, our military and its citizens. Thank you for that. You know, but did you have any military history in your background, any family members who had been in and was that a catalyst as well? Oh, absolutely. I've got several folks on both sides of the family that have served most immediately. You know, I come from a family of five kids. And so three out of the five have served in the military. And um, I have uh, my brother, David, who's still serving. And then my other brother, John, who was formerly in the in the Navy, he served as well. And so uh, that's a that's a testament to uh, how we were raised. I thank my mother and my my father for that great granddad, uncle, aunt, cousin, it goes on from there. We talked last time about uh, my uh, links to Drapper Kaufman, who was the first frogman, uh, which is where the Navy SEALs hail from. And uh, so lots lots of positive influence there. There was always a small wall in my home where we were honoring those who had served before us. And so I'm happy to be a part of that wall now. Absolutely. And an outstanding part of it too. You know, what do you think were the, was the biggest the biggest change for you once you made that commitment to go into the Navy, as far as leaving the civilian world and going into the service, what was, what do you think was the, was the biggest challenge? I think for me, it was, uh, it was, it's, I had to get used to it being so regimented. Um, I came from a uh, health insurance, uh, healthcare administration background where I was a hospital administrator that helped build one of the first provider sponsored healthcare corporations in Georgia, and it was very successful. And I was jo- enjoying the um, trajectory of success and doing it with whatever ideas uh, I could get our board of physicians to approve. And I had no left, right, lateral limits, and I enjoyed that. And I, I thrived on uh, creativity and the opportunity to implement a plan and execute it and succeed. And so I think for me, my greatest adjustment was coming into the military where, you know, everything's zero six toes on the line, save first and last name, you know, so that took some getting used to. And I got to be honest with you, I, I still get used to it, right? It's, I find it very difficult sometimes to, to stay within those. I, I test them some, but, um, but I appreciate uh, my time and in, in learning to navigate, if you will, the, those uh, limitations on what it is we can and cannot do. But I, I have to say that also, I've been pleased to um, to implement innovation in our military as well. Sorry for the background noise there. So to me, it's balanced out. I think that, I, I don't think I know I'm in the place where I'm supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And we all have periods of our life where we grow. And I've I've certainly uh, benefited from that. And I think that people around me have benefited from it as well. Well, I'm sure they have. That's an excellent answer. You know, we smoke and joke about it, you know, and we get into go Navy and go Army. And by the way, you did get us this year. Congratulations. But, you know, and you alluded to this, Commander, you alluded to the the training and, you know, and, and how no matter what branch you go into, you we can we you can rest assured that you're going to get that type of training that you're going to get this leadership type of training and be able to handle challenges and like you say implement plans and and you know being part of a mission and a part of a team and you know the things that you don't necessarily find in the civilian world you can carry over once you do leave the service but we're not talking about leaving the service right now what we're talking about is what so many Americans both men and women in all branches have been going through and have a lot the last nearly 20 years, but also throughout all of our history, the word deployment and what deployment means. And it's pretty significant because, you know, when you sign up and you raise the right hand and you swear an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States, it's serious business. Most of the service people that I've met, in fact, if not all of them, when they do that, they do so with a great love of country, but they also know that there's a risk. And the risk is they may be called upon at any time that our leaders who run our country say, we need to go take care of business and we need to do it now. Tell us about 
your experience with deployment and what it meant to you, because I know you've deployed before. In fact, you've, you've been over there quite a few times. What did it mean to you and, and what did you go through for those deployments? Well, the first time I deployed, of course, was to Afghanistan as an individual augmentee, actually with the Army. Remember, we talked about the fact that I had uh, become part of um, uh, the 41st uh, BCT out of Oregon and went over as part of a, a team of folks to train the female uh, Afghan National Army, things like how to shoot their AK-47. So I did, you know, security protocol. I was flipping through through some pictures the other day and I was standing guard at a security gate. I mean, it blows my mind when I look back and I think, wow, what a ride. You know, I, I, <laughs> I really never imagined doing that, of course, most notably as part of the Navy. So we'll talk about that in a minute, too. But to me, the first deployment and I and I see it in a lot of our troops, too, was an opportunity to go and do what we raised our hand to do. And that is to defend our country. And there's pride in doing that. And, and that pride is a result of our own individual choice to serve our country that is fostered by our respective services once we join. And what I always try to do in, in, in teaching and coaching and leading, I, I try to remind everyone that you, you're, you're your own individual. And you're the person who made the decision to join the service. The service doesn't make us who we are. We come as a person having made the decision and the dedication to serve our country. And I think that that's where we're experiencing some of our obstacles right now is to a degree, I think that those who serve and maybe have a difficult time transitioning is they, they maybe got lost, their, their identity got lost. We need to remember that as individuals, we choose to serve and we do so at the behest of our nation and the citizens who choose to support our military. You know, I remind folks all the time that we have a tax structure, remember, that supports the <laughs> oh, defense yeah. of our that that supports the defense of our nation, and so we have to remember that. In my opinion, as those of us um, that get ready to leave on deployments, is our nation, the people of this great nation, employ us to go do a job, and it's our opportunity now, uh, to, and any time we deploy, to demonstrate our skill our readiness, our knowledge, our preparedness, and frankly, our diplomacy after having worked with so many other countries, right? That this is this is our time. And a good portion of the forces that that we see that are, are leaving constantly, you know, we always have troops that are rotating. It's just they're they're prepared, they're ready, and they're frankly excited to go and do the job which we're employed to do as a result of our own individual decision to raise our hand. In fact, you know, anyone that raises their hand, it, it says in the in the testament of oath of enlistment or oath of office that it's not being done under duress. This is something we volunteer to do. And so that is what I try to remind the troops is that this is your opportunity to shine. This is your opportunity to go and do exactly what we want to do, what we said we wanted to do, and that's defend our nation. You know, I, I like the way you said that, and it's, you know, it clarifies it even more for me. And, you know, I like I like to to appreciate that. that you're right. We did volunteer. There's been some exceptions with drafts over the years, but we did volunteer, and, and we do work for our country. At that time, you know, we heard about GI issue, and we, we and they make fun, you know, we're just, we're just property and we're another number. You know, we're still people. But now we're people of a larger force of individuals that are committed to value sets that are very similar. And I, I love that because, you know, I, I got to tell you, you know, I've been out for quite a while, but for the first time in my life being in the United States Army, I really, really, really felt like we were one force. And, and I don't think you can, you know, we're all Americans. We get that. But it's different when you put on a uniform because then there's a... Uh, there's a certain persona it doesn't make us any better. It's just a it's a feeling you get. And it's one of immense pride. Doesn't matter if you're a private or a general or an admiral or whatever. I can assure you, and I know Commander Aaron Sebia can too, 
that there's a level of pride that goes with that. And and I never got deployed. I guess I was one of the lucky guys, maybe, or unlucky. I don't know. But, you know, I, we were there ready to go, and, and it just wasn't my time. And so I can't – I don't know anything about deployment. The only deployments that I had were training exercises out in the desert. So you get the orders to deploy. Tell us the process. What happens? Well, um, so so let's talk about the training for just, just a moment. So – the training is all a part of deployment, right? right. There's the readiness aspect of it. And so training as well takes you and, and the rest of us who serve away from our families. It's kind of like a mini deployment, if you will. And the last time that we spoke, we talked about um, temporary active duty or going TDY. It means you're away from your home base. You're away from your family. You're focused on training. That's kind of like a mini deployment. And for some, it, in some instances, that lasts up to, you know, maybe a week or two weeks, two weeks, or gosh, in the case of folks that are going right now, you know, in some instances, it's nine months. It's still a deployment, right? So so I think that there's always this um, <laughs> this awareness of the distance created from your family, whether it's a deployment or whether it's training. And then as a kind reminder, I know, you know, that you had days when, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get home. It's not a nine to five job. No. Not, right. I think and it's so, like 24 seven, 365, you know. Well, well, some, you know, yeah. I, I will tell you that there's balance in that, but it's not necessarily just the deployment. It's, a, it's the, it's the training as well. It's the, right. it's the, um, it's the intrusive information that you have to ask, you know, in order to get ready to deploy. One of the things that I've experienced recently and getting, you know, preparing to to do my job is every service member who leaves their family for an extended period of time to go and deploy faces their mortality. And we do this because you have to make sure your will's in place. You have to make sure you communicated with people in your family about what you want done. If you don't come back, you have to even get down into the details about who gets the flag. And so all of these things, while you're in your mind thinking about getting your gear ready and everything else, you have this constant barrage of, well, your family needs to be prepared. And part of that preparedness for your family is you must face your own mortality and you must hand over a packet of papers to your friends and family that says, if I don't come back, here is everything you need. And, and I think that's one uh, good in many ways, but it's also, it could also be difficult and you could potentially be caught up in that, you know? So having a real good family base and a good support system of friends and family is so important. Um, otherwise, you just don't have the strength to face your own mortality and, and do well with that and still be ready to get out the door with all your gear. You've got you've to have balance. You've got to have support from family, from friends. And that's all part of preparedness. Definitely a good way of looking at, you know, I didn't realize that. I didn't think about it. And you just made me, here I am all these years later thinking about, you know, we lost people on those training exercises. Yes. So yes. heavy equipment, troop transports, big pieces of armored tanks. And I mean, yeah, helicopters at night and all kinds of interesting things. And I never thought about that. But, you know, even being active duty maybe not being deployed overseas is, is a commitment that takes you away from your family. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, you know, with my job, one of my main responsibilities is to produce casualty estimates. I have to foresee out of every training evolution and every mission we do, I have to provide an estimate for how many people could potentially be hurt or killed doing this evolution, whatever that is. And we, we provide medical support to training evolutions right here in the United States. So you're right. And I think we need to pause for effect here when we talk about, you know, there are people who have lost loved ones as a result of training exercises. They walked out the door. They had breakfast with their family. They left to go to the field for just two days. And guess what? They didn't make it back. And it was right down the street. It's a good point, you know, I, and, and which reminds us again how dangerous of a job it truly is. And 
which reflects back on the leadership. You know how big we are on leadership. And because we have officers and NCOs and uh, uh, lower enlisted ranks that take care of the troops and sailors and airmen and women around them, we try to alleviate those casualties. Of course, deployment in the combat zone is an entirely different ball game. You've been around enough families that that have been that have had sons and daughters deploy. What do you see them going through? For those who I can tell have a good support system, like myself, and this is a testament to my family and my friends. You're included in that, of course. Thank you. I'm able to focus on my job. I have a lot of humor in my life. And so that helps me help other people. And so I have paid particular attention to other troops who are preparing to deploy as again, you know, this happens all the time. We don't, we're not having a large group of people deploy because of any one thing we're doing it on a rotational basis all the time. Uh, just happens to be getting a lot of press, um, right now. Hmm. But when I see, um, other troops and that that's inclusive of Marines, uh, Navy, Air Force, Army, I try to look them in the eye. I try talking with them. Hey, how are you? How's your family? How was your holiday? And I try to have usual dialogue in order to determine, is this an individual who needs a little bit of added help or a little extra attention? Or do they need the, you know, is that concept of a battle buddy? Hey, how you doing? And I can tell you that I see a lot of good. And I just don't think it gets a lot of attention. I think that there are a plethora of resources available through the military. There's your unit, uh, your leadership. There are all kind of existential uh, programs that are out there now, all kinds of wellness and behavioral health. I see good things happening in with uh, physical training units, you know, small unit leadership. So my impression of how we're doing uh, right now in active duty and reservists when they're when they're mobilized, I think we're doing a pretty good job. We're watching each other. Do I feel like there are opportunities for continued improvement and, and emphasis in areas where maybe there needs to be continued situational awareness of opportunities for us to help our brothers and sisters? Sure. But there's a good story out there, and it just never gets enough attention. Well, you definitely shed some light on it. And you know what's interesting when you talk about it, Commander, that something that came to light with me is that the the, the, the family members of the service members actually become a family themselves. You know, it, it's not like having a job in a corporate environment because you go home and you might have a, a party every now and then. But in the military, it's a little bit of a different type of organization. And so the family members almost become and rely on each other as well, just like the service members do. You know, that's a good segue into a quick little story. I, As I was mobilizing myself recently, it was brought to light that there were several other folks uh, who are getting ready to be part of a unit. And the families of those individuals were going to try and make it to the airport to see their loved ones between Thanksgiving and Christmas before they deployed. And we did everything we could to make that happen. And it just didn't line up. And what ended up uh, happening, I feel like was, was very positive that the spouses and the children all had a big Thanksgiving together, minus their loved ones who had to deploy. But you had strangers come together and become cohesive. And they're going to need that during this period of time where their family members are deployed. And I want to say another thing too, you know, over the course of the last say 20 years, where there has been a lot of deployments and uh, it, and no doubt it's been uh, difficult on families. I believe that there's some resilience that's happened. And so we stay in uh, an unfortunate uh, state of readiness, if you will. If you were to talk to my daughter, Aspen, I tell her, hey, you know, I've got this deployment. It's going to be for uh, almost a year. All right, mom, well, give me your address and we'll see you when you get back. Now, I'm not saying that that's the way ideally it should be, but there's strength in unity. And as a result of that, there's resilience. And that's where I kind of get back to having a little bit of a, a sense of humor and knowing that, hey, we've got it here at home. You've been gone so many times. We got this. 
So the magic happens, though, when there's a balance between what the families know to do to continue to support the service member, how communicative the service member is able to be while they're deployed. Look at the technology we have. You know, you and I can see each other. Well, as long as there's access to, to Wi-Fi, there's the opportunity to maintain that communication and see each other. And then there's letter writing and email and all these other modes of communication that's ease that a little bit. I'm not saying it's easy. I don't want to take away from the difficulty there is in separation because I feel that too. It's just keeping things in perspective and understanding the support that you have that's there and and having a healthy outlook. That's a great point. And, you know, I think you were reading my mind because those letters and those phone calls and the use of these technologies to stay in contact are vitally important uh, to the mental health of not only the family members back home, but I got to tell you, even even being in peacetime army, anytime I got a letter from home, whether it was a friend down the street or from my mom or my dad, it was a thrill. You know, it was nice to, you know, to hear your name and somebody, hey, somebody actually thought about me. I can't even imagine what it would be like in a combat zone, the importance of of having that support network. Um, I know we, my wife and I just sent a care package to some FOB over in, in Afghanistan, and it was really cool to put the pieces in there. And I know the faces on those soldiers, wherever it ended up, probably just lit up. And so I'm glad you mentioned that, Commander, about how important it is to keep communication going. Communication in whatever medium there is available. And, and you know, going back to that whole philosophy about being a good battle buddy, when you're in theater, you know, be personable and sit down, share a meal with somebody, look them in the eyes, talk to them about what's going on. Um, notice if there's somebody that's not in the circle at night when everybody's kind of sitting around at the end of the day. Talk to people in the gym. You know, everybody's got their headphones on and everything, but it can be as easy as just a quick nod, you know, just to, to, to acknowledge another human being. Um, and it doesn't necessarily, you know, it's not always... It's not always U.S. either. I mean, gosh, I mean, I, I was in a class today where we had two German officers and it was a fantastic experience. They got up and they briefed their operation and it was just it was just really a cool thought. Like, wow, look at how far we've come. Why is it that we focus on the things that are not good? I'm standing alongside two Germans who just got done briefing a war plan that just, you know, just because of their accents alone, it sounds like it's going to work. But, you know, <laughs> but what I I'm saying imagine. is that, you know, I, I imagine that the world is a much more peaceful place. And it seems preposterous to, to think that way, especially now. But I do. I just I just have had a lot of really good experiences. And and I walk around the base and I and I, I talk to folks and you know, they're communicative and I wouldn't say, you know, not everyone's happy about having to deploy. No, I'm disappointed in some instances. It means I don't get to see my family as much, but do I have everything I need? Absolutely. And who do I have to thank for that? My family, my friends, and guess what? The citizens of the United States who pay for us very well, mind you, to go and do our job. So, if we adopt this philosophy of more positive thinking and start to look at the things that are working, then maybe it is that we would have fewer people that get into a little bit of a rut and can't get out of it. Definitely a great point. And, you know, which leads into the civilians that you talk about, which do support us. And, you know, despite what we might be reading in some of the various outlets, I would like to think, based on what I've seen, that a majority of American citizens absolutely support everything the military does. And that being said, what do you think civilians can do? They're already doing a lot by paying their taxes, but what do you think they can do as part of that deployment process to help the whole overall process? What do you think they can do, Commander? I can just continue to do what they're doing now. I think there are so many organizations out there that that help military members, that that help veterans. Uh, veterans helping active duty, veterans helping veterans, you know, the care packages help, communication helps. I try to make sure I don't have a skewed view just because I have all of the support and love I could possibly ask for. I have to remind myself that, you know, there may be somebody who might not have that. Or, you know, like, for instance, 
people who are having to deploy and they recently had a death in the family or something that they haven't had time to process through all the steps of grieving before they have to go and do their job. I feel like that the general public already does a very good job of support to our military. I really do. I'm, I'm so proud to be from the United States and proud to represent the citizens of the United States and what they do for our country. And furthermore, I'm just as happy to represent the person who does not support our military because they are exercising their freedom to do so. That's a great point because, you know, so often we get wrapped up with these strong emotions and, you know, the name calling goes and the stigma of putting labels on people. And you know what? You're right. They do have that right. And uh, and I applaud them as well because it takes real courage sometimes to stick with your core values. And they may not align with mine, but, but you know, I've got to respect them for theirs. And that's a great point. So, you know, one thing that you alluded to, and then I and I think it's a very important point based on the holistic aspect of what you do in the Navy, is situational awareness. You know, and staying um, staying in tune to the environment around you and to the people that you work with because people handle stress in different ways. And obviously, deployment in a in a more challenging environment can play on the psyche. So you know. What can people who are deployed do? You mentioned the gym, and but what can they do to keep an eye on their their teammates? Well, I think the first thing again is that connectedness, right? You you whether you're you're a stranger to someone, you know, it's a human to human thing. It's it's looking people in the eyes. It's looking up from your phone. It's setting your phone down, but then using your phone as a tool to to remember to be. Uh, in communication with people when it's over distance, right? And to be as personable as we can, utilizing the mediums that are available. I think that it's important here to emphasize that those of us who, who serve in the military have a great appreciation for people back home who are on what we call the front lines. So uh, we talked a little bit about this once before the first responders, the teachers, you know, they're the people who are taking care of our families while we're deployed. And they're actually on the on the front line and, you know, sadly uh, face the same very the, the very same threats that we face overseas. And in some instances, I would argue that it's almost more safe to be somewhere else rather than in the classroom or on the streets of America. Shame, shame, shame. Right. So I think for any group of people who are charged with the level of security of other humans just needs to have an open mind and an open heart and and open eyes and and really make a human connection, no matter who you are or what your job is. You're right. It's it's still about the people, you know, and the people, you know, so we get deployed, we go over, we accomplish the missions and not everybody comes home. And those soldiers and those sailors, and the airmen and women, they all come back, right? The ones that, re- that that do make it. And it's an adjustment period. It's known as transition, you know, that they do get out. What's the transition like and what should we be looking for? I know that every branch has an out process, you know, and they're constantly looking to improve it. What can we expect from people that are coming home from deployment? What can the families? Yeah. I really like that you asked that question because it's fresh on my mind for obvious reasons. So in transitioning back home, the branches of the military, all of them have created uh, for, for most a transition period that lasts over the course of say two or three weeks where you're taking steps to deploy rather than, you know, just necessarily being plucked out of the field, go pack your stuff, you're going to get on a C-130 and go home. So it's a little bit more, there's more of a process involved in the transition that involves a little bit of R&R. So for instance, um, if you're, say, an individual augmentee, in particular the Navy, I'll speak on behalf of my own service, the Navy has taken steps to acknowledge that as an individual augmentee, you are going to be assigned most likely to another service, usually the army. And so that means you're not going as a unit, you're going with a unit that you don't know. And so I, for instance, have just processed through these very same steps is you go through an orientation as an individual, 
there's a team of people on the Navy base who are assisting you with processing. You go through your medical. You're doing this all by yourself. Right. Because you're not going through with the units. Right. And then take steps to move through the second phase of processing, which is a little bit more emphasis on readiness, a little bit more emphasis on the medical requirements, definitely more uh, emphasis on training and how to to prepare. I feel like the Navy in particular and the Marine Corps has done an excellent job of acknowledging that, whoa, that's a really difficult thing. And we're here to help you. And yes, you are an individual augmentee to another force. However, there are many individual augmentees that are like you and we're here to help. And so I've been given a, a lot of resources and I am in touch with a lot of people um, that are assigned to assure that if there's anything I need at a moment's notice, I have a phone number, I have an email, I get texts, how you doing, how you processing and all through through that deployment process. Now. When we talk about redeployment, at the front end of deployment, they're teaching us, okay, you're going to go through this process, you're going to deploy. While you're deployed, we'll check with you, we'll continue to maintain all your, your personnel type stuff. They explain to you how you're going to be evaluated, which is nice, right? Because that's not the first thing on our mind, hopefully, it's to just do a good job, not to right. not to not to make the next rank necessarily, but let's face it, that's how you make the next rank. You do a good job. Exactly. And so, so they're explaining, okay, here are the steps, here are who is going to be in, in touch with you and, and go and do a good job. And there's a nice, smooth transition to the unit. Now, given the fact that there are some logistics full pause, right? <laughs> We can, can travel and transit for the most part. I personally, now this is my third time going through this process and they, they are educating us on what's to come and what to expect for our redeployment. And so I've already been given a, a deployment packet to give to my family, to, to share with them about here's what happens, you know, with your, with your loved one, when they go through this, the redeployment process is that I'll be in contact with uh, my parent command through a coordinator that handles individual augmentees. And then I'm also part of my Navy Marine Corps unit where I'm headed. And then I'll spend some time transitioning at one, two, three stops before I actually uh, come home and see my family again, which, which allows for that time to Go through a lot of the paperwork while you're still transitioning. You'll likely it is, you know, you go through Germany or one of these other transient uh, countries that they send us through with a little bit of time to process at each station. No longer, we're gone out of days. In in most instances, you're going to go over there and then, you know, you you might come back. We don't know when. And we're going to try and find out who's going to take care of you. I, I feel like that the Navy and Marine Corps in particular have done a very good job at this. Now, typically it is that the, the Army will deploy. And I, and I want to I want to caveat what I'm saying that special forces is different. OK, right. That, that I think I think that there's a whole different um, it, it's in some instances it's better support. And in some instances it's, hey, you got to go. But that's what they're trained to do. Right. That's what they're employed to do. So, you know, back to the, our, our regular force structure is that redeployment is phased now and it allows for time for the individual before we rejoin with our families to get to that baseline again. I remember you and I spoke last time about one of the most impressionable changes that I experienced in coming back from being in Afghanistan for a year was just simply color. I was overwhelmed almost by, you know, and as soon as I landed in the United States, I, I came from Afghanistan where everything was, you know, the color brown or beige in most cases. And when I got, when I got back to the United States, everything was bright and, you know, it was marketing and so many choices. And, it, you know, at first it was a little overwhelming. I kind of yeah. had to like get, get like, okay, traffic, you know, there's traffic in Afghanistan, but, I'm saying that it was just different. And I, I and I appreciated the time to transition by taking some leave, but acknowledge the difficulty in 
deployment as an individual augmentee or small unit, they are providing that time to transition back. And that's sure appreciated, I know. Definitely some great viewpoints based on your own experience and what you've seen and believe. Let me ask you this, Commander, put your commander leadership hat on. I know you got sure. it, I know you got it on all the time, but pick three things that you would tell as a Navy commander to a first time deploying service person. And then give us three things that you would say to somebody coming back home. Getting ready to leave. The number one thing is know your higher order, your higher power, your God, or who it is that you're one with, that you're your creator. Know who that is and be at one with them and spend time with whoever that is, however you choose to, at whatever part of the day is best for you. I think that that provides um, introspection and solace. And that's necessary. So that's the first thing. The second thing would be um, communicate uh, with your family and your friends. Let them know how much you appreciate them. Gosh, doesn't it make you feel good when you tell somebody thank you? You know, oh, we yeah. know this from working with the Gratitude Professor Foundation and and just telling people thank you. That's so important. And uh, you never want to leave without without saying something, not saying something you should have said. And so again, that connectedness, right? And then frankly, right up there is be organized, have your, have your stuff that you need to do your job. And we should have that ready all the time. But I think those things um, separately and together in unison help us be uh, optimized for our responsibilities when we deploy. So, so that's deployment. Now you said coming back. Uh, same thing remains for number one, you know, know your creator. Um, and and spend time in solace, however you choose to do that. Just that that downtime, that quiet time uh, in any part of your day. The second thing is um, don't lose touch with the people that you just spent a year of your life with or however long your deployment was. And allow yourself to open up enough for those people to as well become a part of your life. And for those people also to, to know family members, friends that you have. And some of my treasured friends are, are people that I deployed with time and time again. I can tell you, I, I was just, I, I'm reunited all the time with, with people that, that I deployed with. I can't give you one example, which is a great problem, you know? And so, so acknowledge that the people that you just spent time with have become your family and make sure you're communicating that with your family and your friends at home. Hey, this is so-and-so. This is how we worked together. And make plans to continue to foster those relationships. So that's number two. And then three is come back with a healthy, happy heart and be ready to do it all again if you have to. Well, I like that. You know, it's definitely some great advice on both sides of going over and coming back. Is there any personal mantra you know, I know you've been very busy lately, and we're not going to give away what's going on. There's a lot of things going on these days in the media, and I, I know that you're getting ready to do something. We don't know, but I know you're going to do it in high fashion. Do you live by like a personal mantra? Do you have one? Just be happy and peaceful. I can't off the top of my head think of anything beyond just just being grateful. I mean, there are people, and we know this, that don't have the ability to get up and get out of bed. And if you can get up in the morning, breathe, stretch, you know, whatever it is that you do, uh, I think we just need to be grateful for, for what we have. You know, if, if more people looked at the opportunity to enjoy their day as a gift, I think the world would be a much better place. But, you know, in saying that, I don't think it's a bad place after all. I mean, I remember that you interviewed Roy Duncan. Oh, what a hero. Right? Oh, my gosh. That guy was and, awesome. And let me tell you. He is one of the happiest people, 98 years old, right? 11th Armored Division. Oh, world my war gosh. II, you, you never uh, complained a bit. When did, yeah. General Patton. And guess what? He always has a smile on his face, and I love it. And so I think that succinctly my mantra is really, I don't know. When people ask me, like, what's your favorite this? What's your favorite? I don't know. And I enjoy finding out every day. I'm happy for every day I have. Well, for those of you who haven't seen Commander Aaron Seabee in action, like some of us have had the honor to do so, you know, 
and this is again not blowing smoke, but you carry yourself with outstanding bearing. Your heart is exemplified in the way you respond to people and how you interact. I mean, I'm not an expert in human interactivity, but I've had the opportunity to see you. And uh, it's outstanding because you represent the Navy exceptionally well, and you represent women in uniform exceptionally well. And I, I can just tell you that to spend time with us on the show today speaks volumes about who you are and your commitment to not only excellence, but to those brothers and sisters who wear the uniform next to you, I couldn't imagine not having somebody like you around, you know? So it's just, it's an honor to know you, ma'am. And I just want to say, I appreciate your time here and wherever you go and whatever you're getting ready to do, we want to wish you Godspeed. We want to wish you the best of luck, but, but not really luck. We really want to keep you in our prayers. And I just want to say, Thank you again for being on the show, and I look forward to our next meeting. And wherever you go, if you ever need anything, you got somebody right here that will support you 110%. So I just want you to know that. So thank you for, for being who you thank are. Thank you, John. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I have to tell you, you know, I and so many others, I, I just, you know, I had to walk up a hallway and see everybody with their sea bags and army Navy, doesn't matter. We're all ready for anything. We really are. And it's a testament to our readiness. And as we started the show, it's our opportunity to do what we promised we would, and that's to defend our nation and make it just and a peaceful place for us all to continue to enjoy. And I thank you for all that you do, um, the, all, all that you continue to do. Uh, you do so much for our veterans, for just, you know, the, the, the general public and raising awareness. And we can't be without that. We have to continue to do that. And, you know, for building friendships and for building a family of support. And uh, I, as I have told every one of my family members and, and my friends, I take a part of you with me. I take a part of everyone that I've ever interacted with with me. And I will come home and I will bring brothers and sisters home and it's going to be okay. Well, God bless you and God bless America. And, and I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you, Commander. Absolutely. It should be an exciting one. You gotta light them up before they burn it down. Thank you for listening to another episode of Straight Outta Combat Radio, audio medicine from Green Zone Hero. If you liked what you heard, then tell others about us. Like us and download us. And please remember, freedom is not free, and combat veterans are vital assets. They're not broken. Hey.